Okay, welcome to today's weekly charting analysis webinar. Uh, my name is Jasper Lawler, market analyst here at SimC. Uh, we've got the risk warning on the screen here. I will um, take you through that first. But uh, a pretty huge week in markets. Um, not because of Jeremy Corbyn being elected Labour of the Labour Party. Uh, that certainly could be relevant for the UK economy and for UK stock markets. Um, it's really all about the Fed this week. We could see uh, should we, could see a rate rise. A lot of people calling for it, and um, markets quite calm today. But uh, I suspect that could be the calm before the storm because we've seen a lot of volatility recently, and. You know, a lot of it, that comes from China. Thankfully, we don't have much in the way of Chinese data this week. Uh, we had some over the weekend, uh, but actually mining companies are some of the top performers uh, on the UK 100, and um, they're typically some of the most exposed to what's going on in China. So perhaps we've got to a stage where at least in the short term we're looking through what's going on in China and concentrating and looking more ahead to what's happening at the Federal Reserve. And at the end of the day, you know, what's, what took place in China largely relates to uh, the Fed keeping interest rates low. You know, emerging markets have been borrowing large amounts in U.S. dollars over the past few years with low interest rates. But um, the, the chance of uh, interest rates going up means they'll be paying more in their debt. At the same time, China's economy is slowing. And the reason China chose to devalue their currency the other week um, was in large part, I think it's generally understood, uh, because the US dollar had gone up so much in anticipation of this, uh, rate, right, uh, this rate rise because the Chinese yuan is um, pegged to the US dollar. So while their economy was slowing, um, their, their currency was pick up in value and damaging their exports. <clears throat> so, yeah, it's really it's going to it's going to really be about the the Fed. We we can um, we'll certainly look at the currencies, the U.S. dollar, you know, being the main focus there, of course. But we do have um, a fair fair few uh, important economic releases uh, before the Fed. Not least inflation data for the U.S. the day before on Wednesday. The Fed. The Fed meetings are the final day of the meetings on Thursday when we hear their decision. Uh, but we've also got UK and Eurozone inflation on Wednesday. So that will give us a bit more information as to uh, what the timing of any rate rise from the Bank of England would be. Uh, it's expected that actually month over month inflation may have actually dropped into the negative because of the drop in oil prices. So if anything, the timing on a Bank of England rate rise is probably going to be pushed out a little bit. But we've also got um, the uh, Treasury Select Committee hearings with Mark Carney. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that, that inflation data for the UK coupled with whatever Mr. Carney has to say um, about the prospect of a rate rise and how close the UK economy looks to uh, a stage where inflation is actually going to start moving towards the target will be, you know, a major determinant in the direction of the pound. But gains probably are going to be fairly limited um, for, you know, any gains that might occur in the pound because, again, we've got that Fed meeting the next day, which is going to dictate the direction of the, uh, the U.S. dollar. So since we're talking about currencies and things, let's just dip straight into it. I mean, we've been talking about cables, so let's have a look at, let's have a look at the British pound. <coughs> Now, this is a short-term chart. Let's uh, zoom things out a bit. First, we'll get that weekly perspective. So, we were uh, we were in, in, in a, an uptrend. We've broken above this peak here, made a higher high, made a higher low, uh, made a higher high again, but it was only just a higher high. And at that time, that's when I started to suggest that probably we were in for a bit of a, a deep correction because it only just slightly took out the previous high, more characteristic of a sort of range trade than a, than a solidly performing trend. That's what happened. We ran into what became sort of a triangle formation, and then a couple of weeks ago, we, we broke down through that triangle, and now we're basically in this horizontal range. It's, um, it's pretty much one, 152 to 158 is the range that we're working on at the moment. 
Now that was quite it was quite a, a strong week last week for the British pound. Pretty much undid all of the previous week's weakness, and so we we'll basically find ourselves sitting in the middle of a range. Now that tends to be a bit of a tricky place to carry out your trades when markets are sideways. The highest probability bets are at the top and bottom of the range, trading back into the range and eventually trading with a breakout. Uh, in the middle of the range, it really could drop down to the lower range again, could move up to the top. We don't really know. You know, if it may be odds slightly favor and move back towards the top of the range since the last place we were was the the bottom of the range, but that certainly doesn't always hold true. Uh, now, if we do now within the, so with the context of that sideways environment, we can look to the uh, the daily time frame. You see that we've we've edged above this uh, low here. But what I tend to do is when there's a few lows in in close vicinity, and you'll see this. I've done this in the particularly the the uh, US SPX chart in terms of stock indices, we've got a few of these zones. So this, I like this rectangle tool that we got for the charting package because you can basically create a zone instead of a, a horizontal level. So you see that we broke through that initial low horizontal level here, but actually if you consider this a kind of support zone which is broken and now is potentially turning into a resistance zone, then actually we've really barely eked out of there. And that does some, that's some sort of capping the upside for the moment. So the, the recent momentum obviously was, was strongly down, and so we've got a few, a few, a few, um, few places that gains could be capped on the way back up towards the top of the range. I would suggest this low here would probably be the next major one, which corresponds with, depending on the timing, vaguely would correspond with a retouch of that broken trend line. And I think a lot of people will have this trend line. You know, it's got one, two, three, four, five fairly decent decent touches. So I think that will be on a lot of people's charts. And if we get a move back towards there, which does kind of correspond with those lows thereabouts and about the sort of 156 hard number, that um, could at least cause a bit of a, a, a rollover in price. Um, what I tend, what I tend to do, which um, in a range trading environment doesn't really work so well. I think we've got to, got to, got to accept the fact that we were at an extreme overbought level. We went straight down to an oversold level. So really, I think the range is just 20 to 70 at the moment. In, when you're in a strong trend, you can highlight maybe the overbought area down to uh, down to 40. And that would be our bullish zone. I'll show this in another chart that I've got it a bit more clearly. In a, bear, a bearish zone, would be more like 20, back up to 60. So if the RSI stays within there, it can help you define the trend. Again, I'll, I'll give a better example on the, in the other chart. But for this example, you know, I think we're really swinging between overbought and oversold. Very characteristic for the sideways market. So potential opportunities in here, but still, again, we're you know the best opportunities are going to be up the top here and down here. Let's look at the euro. Now, as I mentioned, we do have eurozone inflation this week, and we obviously had the ECB last week, which um, did initially cause a bit of a break higher um, in uh, in equities, and saw the euro push higher a bit, but. Um, push lower, sorry, right immediately following the meeting. But um, the, the effect wasn't too long-lasting. They didn't really introduce any more policy um, if you if you weren't following at the time on that day. Um, they really just adjusted the, the quota of how many bonds of a certain issue they can buy. So they can now buy, uh, I believe they said a third of the issuance, um, and that's up from uh, a quarter. So, you know, definitely, uh, definitely dovish wording, um, rhetoric from Mario Draghi, the ECB head, and that's um, theoretically, um, uh, you know, a cap on high how the euro can go. But really, you ought to say that um, even if eurozone inflation drops again, which it probably will um, in in August. The, it's really it's going to be the dollar end of the equation which determines the direction of the euro here. Now, this daily chart's a bit choppy and it's pretty, pretty difficult to trade, but I think a bit more instructive, if you jump out to this weekly chart, you can see we're actually ke keeping quite well within the fi refines of a, of a triangle pattern. Now, we had a false breakout of the top of the triangle here. 
Now, the only trouble I have with this is that we are moving closer into the apex of the triangle. And really, when you get into the final, the, the breakout wants to happen in the vicinity of the first two-thirds, around two-thirds in of the triangle. Into that last third, the breakouts tend to be a bit choppy and unsustained. But quite a strong reversal to the downside there, but we didn't get any follow-through after that. So a big, big bearish signal, uh, but no one quite willing to carry it down towards the lows um, that we saw in, uh, in, in late July. Mm -hmm. So whereas in the pound, we're, we have that very much flat, you know, different economic situation for the pound and, and the euro, but obviously both against the dollar, both in a consolidation phase at the moment, the euro in a, in a um, tightening consolidation, as I see it, and the pound in that kind of rectangle range. So those, those horizontal ranges do tend to be uh, the easier to trade because everyone can see those levels. The, um, the, 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 the narrowing range, you know, you can, it can just turn into a, a horizontal level. Um, you know, <clears throat> if we get a breakout from this down here at the trend line, but maybe we just go as far as that previous high and then roll over again. Um, so a little bit harder to trade, but um, you know, both potential breakout situations here. Um, it's more of a triangle, I would say, than, than a um, but something like a flag pattern tends to be a bit quicker to form. If it was, if it was a, a flag or a pennant, then you would suggest that the, the next breakout would be down. Um, th this triangle pattern could really break, uh, given that it's downward sloping arguably and upward sloping, it could break out either way. Could well be a bottom pattern. And again, you know, if the Fed don't hike rates, you know, that's bearish for the dollar and we could see euro breaking higher. Which, um, which is my base case scenario, by the way. I mean, you know, I'm fully uh, aware of the possibility that it's very finely balanced. And, you know, there are economists are literally 50-50 split on whether a rate high rise happens this meeting. I tend to think they'll just err on the side of caution. That's what they've been doing um, under, the rain, under the realm of um, the reign of Janet Yellen, the Fed chair. It's all been very cautious erring to the side of dovishness. So to me, uh, with inflation at the levels it is, with the risks of, of what's been happening in China and poss a possible uh, another temper tantrum taking place in emerging markets, I tend to think they won't hike and that may give a little respite to stock markets, could see stock markets break higher and could see the euro and British pound break higher. <clears throat> Now let's have a look at uh, dollar yen. Dollar yen will be a big mover on the, um, the Fed decision. Before that, though, we do have the the Bank of Japan, um, which is the early hours of tomorrow. Um, there were hints in the news last week from one of uh, I, was it? I don't know if it was Kuroda's aides. It may have been um, may have been the prime minister's, but anyway, one of the officials was basically indicating that um, the October meeting for the Bank of Japan could be a good time for further stimulus. So that would suggest nothing's going to happen tomorrow, uh, but there's a bit of an idea in the background there that maybe the yen could, could weaken further. But I would suggest in two weeks, that is a month away. So again, if the Fed don't cut, I'd see the dollar yen dropping, you know, if they, if they do, uh, sorry, if they do hike. Um, dolly and drop it. Here. Uh, get my words twisted here, but uh, dolly and likely to to drop off. I think purely on that dollar movement. Um, if if they uh, if they don't cut, which I suspect they won't. So the situation here is um, a bit like the bit like the British pound in a way. We've had a, a, a clear a clear break in a rising trend line. We've had the retest already of that rising trend line. Now we've dropped back down not to the uh, not to the spike low, but turn around the lows that formed the support previously here, which is kind of where we finished that. So we spiked all the way down here, closed at that former support level, and then we found support there again, and we were in a range. So I would, I would suggest there are going to be some opportunities, depending on how the candles look. Um, you know, we're kind of struggling with the 200-day moving average at the moment, but again, a, a push into the top of the range uh, around that 122 mark, um, and again near that rising trend line that's been broken, could be opportunities to fade it lower. 
and then the support is pretty much again it's more of a zone but it's it's to me it's it's this level down down to the sort of low here from the next day after that big break lower would take us back down to that 116 handle so let's uh yeah, let's shift over to the uh, the indices now <clears throat> actually i mentioned that the the u s s p x chart the s and p five hundred basically um now here you can see um some of these zones now you can see that you know the these support levels they are working it's just it's not a um it's not a perfect science basically um we dropped right down into the vicinity of this low. We didn't quite make it to the very low, about sort of 1820. But we got to 1835, and, uh, and we reversed pretty hard from there. And again, here's the lows, which, you know, I originally had this zone drawn more like this. We have gone through it. We've gone up to the 2000 mark. Obviously, round numbers are another thing to watch. So really now I've you know I've just redrawn the zone according to those highs that we've made just short of 2,000, and this to me is the former support broken turned into resistance. So we need to break through this resistance zone to have a chance of pushing up to again a fairly clear cut support. You know this is just us chopping around sideways for all of 2015 until we had the big break, and you know this is this is really the way markets work when you when you're in a very tight range it's like a spring getting coiled up and the longer it lasts the longer you stay in those kind of tight ranges the more ferocious the breakout in this case uh, extra ferocious because the because a bear market break tends to be sharper than than an upwards break so you know saw that massive drop you know this is just low volatility building up building up and then spike into high volatility so you know this is this just tends to be how things work. My bias is that we either roll over from this current zone, or you know perhaps if you see something along the lines of the um, you know the Fed not cutting, I think we push back into into this range again, perhaps roll over there from the broken trend line, uh, and maybe even just stay in a sort of horizontal range between between these two zones, calm down a bit. And depending on how rhetoric changes at the Fed, what's happening in China, determines whether we get a chance of pushing up back into the records. I would suggest I would suggest sentiment's pretty damaged in the stock markets now, and we're probably going to need to see earnings improve a bit in the U.S. fundamentally, and just people to get through this this period of, of being um, being scared with these wide volatile swings in markets. Uh, if we can see such a period of time, then you know, people will ease back into the uh, the stock market again. But I think we're still probably, to my mind, in more of a sell the rallies. Uh, depending on your depending on your approach, if you, you know, if you're a breakout trade, obviously you're selling the break of the lows. But um, you know, broadly characterising it as if you're a swing trader, position trader, you're sort of selling the rallies kind of opportunity more for me at the moment. Given given the size of this move down, you know, you don't uh, psychologically recover from that. Um, in, in the matter of a couple of weeks, typically. Now, US 30 is very much the same. I, I don't think there's a need to, to look at that. Yeah, I thought the S&P is slightly cleaner looking. If we go, jump over to the UK. Now, you notice these, all these markets look pretty similar. Let's firstly remind ourselves of the weekly situation. So I've just, you know, just to remind yourself here, to just you know, a few different things to, to remind yourself of what the trend is. So, you know, one thing a lot of people have been talking about recently, the 200-day moving average, you know, with a 50-day cross is below it, that's the death cross. I don't, um, depending on, the, if there's a really sharp trend going on, I'll have the 50 on there, uh, even the 21. But if there's a, um, if it's basically a chop as it is now, <clears throat> You know, sleep the 200 on there. So we're below the 200. That's bearish. We formed uh, lower highs. So that I, I consider that a peak. That a peak. So it's got two lower candles on either side. And then that's obviously a. Um, you, know, you can actually that's got two two higher closes on either side. So you can call that a, a big weekly low now. So I've got a big X there instead of the little ones, which are for the um, for the daily moves. So general scenario for me is that we're we're trending down on a sort of a weekly candlestick type time frame. 
But if we go to the daily chart, we can see we're actually putting in some uh, higher highs, higher lows. And I think we're, I haven't actually got the 21 day, but I think we may even be above that. Let's just chuck that on there. <clears throat> okay, well, you can see actually you know, it's just worthwhile having on at the moment because that actually sort of is capping the, um, the progress. We haven't seen a close above there for a while. So a close above that 21 would be a good sign, and then clearly just these two peaks, which has become a bit of a zone between here. So we get, the way I view this is, yes, it was a higher high, so I'll put the X there, but, you know, that's a reversal candlestick. That's, that's really a shooting star right there, and so that's why we haven't really built on that break. We know we're just rolling over, basically. So good chance of a, a test back down to the bottom of the range here, and there would be some opportunities again long, but uh, to me... Um, because that would be because we're kind of in a sideways situation on the daily chart, but just bear in mind that the to me the kind of weekly trend is down. And here's where I've got the the RSI. Just we got that big move into oversold, and then we've got these previous two peaks. So for me, while we're below those two previous peaks, which actually corresponds quite well with the 60 um, resistance in a, in a bear zone. You know, the, the, the bias to me is um, to the downside. That's not to say we can't get a break back up to this um, support zone, even the rising trend line, but just that should probably happen within the confines of this zone. If, it, if we push above that and then rebound, maybe re, you know, rebound off the 50 again or something, um, yeah, that's a more positive development for the, um, for the, for the UK 100, our proxy for the, our proxy for the FTSE, obviously. Um, got about uh, got about ten minutes to the end of the webinar here. I'm gonna gonna cover the German stock index. Gonna cover some uh, commodities. But if there is anything else you particularly had in mind that you wanted me to cover that maybe I wouldn't otherwise, then uh, just send a quick chat message through and I'll see that. Do I actually have the chat displayed? I don't. There we go. Okay. So yeah, good thing I had a quick look at that because yeah, an update on wheat requested. So I will get to that shortly. Now, um, I know wheat is just bouncing right off that long-term support again, so yeah, we'll have a look at that for sure. Um, so, so just to sort of cover some of the major indices here, so we covered the US, covered the UK, now let's just look at kind of Europe, you know, Germany's the biggest nation in Europe, Germany 30s, the DAX tends to be one of the most popular indices to trade. Looks pretty similar to the to the FTSE. Now we didn't have um, that uh, shooting star, but we did have a gap higher open on the same day, and then filled the gap on the same day, um, and, and um, so pretty much undone, uh, undid the sort of bullish implications of it, closed back into the range again. And this um, line here, which we're sort of eking around at the moment, just corresponds, if we look, zoom out, just to these um, these peaks that we broke through in, in January of this year in anticipation of, of QE. And we've mentioned this a few times since, but QE basically was announced in around March, we made a new peak in just at the start of April, and that was it. So we put it the beginning of QE pretty much called the top in the Germany 30, ironically, because it was all just front run. That's what this rally was. Anticipation of QE, a couple of weeks later, top. And we've seen a pretty sharp correction since then. Again, partly in relation to um, um, what, what you know, the, the chance of a Fed hiking. You know, it's affecting all the global indices, and again, and, and China, and its devaluation of the yuan. Um, means that the euro is relatively stronger against the yuan, and that hurts the prospects of uh, for, for European exporters. And China is becoming an increasingly large destination of exports. Now, this um, this rising trend line has, has worked pretty pretty nicely. One of the low, um, one up through here worked quite well. Um, and we've already kind of broken that, but this is the, the next layer of it. So you can see that this trend is just sort of decelerating. And again, just looking at these axes here, I'm just kind of classifying this as a um, as a uh, because of bear market trend at the moment. But obviously, fully aware of the fact that we bounced off this rising trend line, 
And should we push higher into another a higher high on the um, you know on the, on the weekly chart? You know that that changes the um, changes the focus. And again, on this daily chart, um, it's it's pretty choppy, but we can basically say it's you know if we just draw a line at the bottom here. that this is our range. And again, just even if you trade in the shorter time frames, you know, this is the con market condition we're in. So, um, you know, if we're down towards the bottom of the range, and you see a, an opportunity to go short. Don't expect it to go that far necessarily. It could, it could obviously be the beginnings of the breakout, but you've got large daily support in the context of a, a sideways market. So it's not going to be an optimum probability trade going short down the, the bottom of the, the daily range. Equally going along at the top, unless you get some kind of confirmed breakout from again from the higher time frame. Mm -hmm. uh, so to me, very similar characteristics to the UK 100, and to me the, the daily trend at the moment is is sideways to slightly bullish. Slightly, you know, you could say that these these two these highs are kind of rising. Got a higher high there. It's a slightly rising um, sideways market. And we need a break either way to know that, to, to have a trend in place. But to me, because we're below again below the 200-day moving average and um, making lower highs and lows on the weekly chart, just to me says um, that the general situation is 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 uh, is a bit bearish. And if I'm going long. I'm on a breakout or buying at the bottom of the, the range. Um, you know, I've got to be wary of that fact that it um, it may go, not go the whole distance. Uh, it may not it just it may not go as far as it would were the trend on the high time frame bullish. Mm -hmm. Let's have a look at that wheat chart before I forget. So, I mean, this is uh, so yeah. This, I, we already had this this support in, and this is, you know, this is a, um, a high probability setup. Now we've missed that initial bit. It is the third test of this line, and does it go back further? I forget. I don't think so. I think. Okay. Well, we've got the support of that that longer term area just beneath us, which is kind of what's playing, what's coming into play at the moment. You know, we're just above that. So, so it's a zone again. So we've got that longer term support, um, which you can sort of very roughly say kind of has been the basis of the range that we've been in. So initial opportunities to buy in off this support, but be aware that the trend is, uh, you know, is down. It's down on the weekly chart. We're below that fairly well defined four touches defined on that declining trend line. But you know we weren't able to make a new low there. We did make uh, we did make a lower high, so we're still within this kind of um, what's becoming a bit of a sort of triangle formation. And um, so sellers are getting more aggressive, but the buyers are holding out at the moment. So this this could go either way. Certainly could break down, but historically with that with that longer term support there, there's a good chance it could break the rising uh, declining trend line. And again, push into that 200-day, which which corresponded here. Also worth noting that the um, the RSI has got a pretty well-defined support here. Sometimes the RSI will break before price does. So if we see RSI moving below 38, to me, that's you know that could be could easily be the the sign that uh, price is about to break below that. Um, 460 area that we're that we're um, that we're holding at the moment. So I hope that I hope that's some help. Um, yeah, I, I know I can appreciate that I haven't dropped to a lower time frame, but um, you know, it's pretty choppy when you look at this the daily chart. I think the, the weekly chart gives you a bit more clarity here. If you're looking for a bit more confirmation of where to um, Of where to take the trade, you know, you could suggest that probably just where we are now is maybe going to cause a bit of a setback. Um, and so maybe if we get a drop down here into the 470s, 
uh, where we were able to, you know, we stumbled there and then we pushed through it. So that would, to me, suggest that 470 type area could be, could find some, some demand. You know, that would be a sort of lower price opportunity or just wait for a break of that declining trend line for a bit more confirmation, albeit at a higher price. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, let's. Um, I hope that's okay. So let's switch over to to gold. Oh, we are actually running a little bit behind here. Um, when I hope not too many of you have to run off for the um, you know for the end of your lunch break. Um, gold chart very interesting at the moment. So basically, had the, I've, I've not just drawn this line in. No, this line was drawn in off these uh, off these lines here. You know, we'd already had sort of four touches of um, um, and then just just extended out here into, in case it could help market find a bit of support actually corresponded nicely to that 1 100 level until so we formed a, uh, a bullish reversal pattern off there so not not you know not as bullish as it could be still a lower close for the for the day on, uh, on Friday last week <clears throat> but nevertheless a hammer pattern and we're edging below that 40 level at the moment, so we're, we're bullish while we're above the 40. You know, this is the, an example of the, um, the kind of bullish range type idea where we got overbought. As long as it holds down above 40, we're good, but it looks like we're pushing down below there as of today. But obviously, we've not closed today yet, so there's, there's no, um, you know, wait for the close of the candle because this easily could push into the low again and form another little nice tail. Um, to suggest that there's buyers at one one hundred, but this rising trend line plus the um, plus the, the reversal pattern plus the, um, the round number, so a few um, few supportive ideas to suggest we could get a push higher, but this this previous low will be the first barrier that we need to get through. So basically, you could call it the one one twenty, which is what I said in the chart forum. You know, close above there definitely increases the chances that we can push back into the uh, the one one fifty type area where we form that lower high. But again, you know, you know, this is a nice confluence of, of support here, but the the trend is down on both a, a weekly time frame and daily time frame. Now let's just um what was the last crude chart I did? I think the last one I did was WTI. Worth mentioning in terms of um, data that um, the last inventory data we got was um, <clears throat> it was quite bearish. It was a surprise, surprisingly higher build-up of U.S. oil stocks, and a um, and it looks like OPEC probably aren't going to have an emergency meeting, just the scheduled one in November. So two quite bearish things for crude oil. Nonetheless, we had that big push off the lows. Um, so it's a bit like that sell-off in stocks. You don't necessarily want to immediately go against that. Uh, and equally with this big pu bullish push here, where we rose in the region of eight and ten percent a few days, uh, three days in a row. Um, you know, we're consolidating off that at the moment. Now this could still be a, uh, a bullish pennant. So if we drop down to a four-hour time frame. You don't even sometimes you, just, you know you don't even need to draw the lines. You, you just know generally what we're dealing with here. <clears throat> Something along those lines. It, similar off the lows. I would argue it's probably more deserving of a horizontal level on the lows. So a push above that declining trend line suggests that to me that we could get another leg. Maybe not quite as ferocious as that, but you know pushing up here at least into the high to 49, maybe up to 50, and we roll from the, the round number. Mm -hmm. So I think that's uh, you know that's uh, that's about it. I think I've covered some of the uh, most important things for the week. Obviously, it's all about the Fed, really. Um, so it's all good that basically the, the week is going to be a build-up to the Fed rate decision. And even though we've got some significant data like U.S. retail sales, <coughs> the BOJ meeting, U.S. industrial production, CPI from the U.S. eurozone and U.K., all of that, the U.K. unemployment rate, even the uh, uh, Treasury Select Committee hearings, we've got all that, but it's, you know, that could be some cause for volatility and positioning, so some opportunities to be had there, 
but I tend to believe that even though we could get some some volatility, some some moves swinging around in the short term, um, probably not going to see any established trends until until Thursday, and we hear from the Fed. All right, I hope that was useful, everyone. Good luck with trading this week. Uh, it's Jasper Wallace signing up. Mm.